All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Rian. Um, like Rihanna and Madonna or whatever. It's just, you don't even worry about the last name. I have the admirable job of keeping you awake in a dark room after lunch uh, by talking about enterprise software. So <laughs> that should be awesome. I have to say that uh, this morning has been quite therapeutic for me. Uh, I feel like if you're a conspiracy theorist, you might think that we all got together in a Slack group somewhere and said, let's all talk about empathy and research. And let's pretend like we didn't talk to each other. We actually didn't, but uh, I'm also going to talk about empathy and research, but uh, possibly in a slightly different, different context. So uh, I work at an enterprise software company called Jive Software. We do uh, collaboration software for internal and external communities. Um, and I've worked in, in both sides. I've worked in consumer, um, on the consumer side as well as the enterprise side. And uh, every time I work on the enterprise side, I start to feel a little sad because uh, I think we'll all agree that, that enterprise software aren't as, isn't as good as it could be. But this turned into a love story for me. So I'm going to tell you a little love story about how uh, I think there's still value in, in designing in the enterprise. The first thing that people usually ask when I tell them an enterprise is something along the lines of, what is wrong with you? Like, why would you put yourself through that? I, think, I guess I have this morbid fascination with making this stuff better. So first, uh, this should be an easy question to answer, but what's so wrong with enterprise software? Um, has anyone ever tried to log into their HR system or their payroll system or try to um, put in PTO and haven't been able to do that? You know what this looks like. These are probably familiar screenshots to you, I guess. Um, these are all HR systems and the type of stuff that is what we call enterprise software. This is software that people use at work for work. That's how we define it. Um, there's also a lot of this in, in real life. I, had to, I was in DC earlier this week and I spent most of my time in front of this machine trying to figure out how to buy a train ticket. Um, and, but when I eventually figured it out, I did make it out to the Air and Space Museum and then I thought, well, if the Apollo people could figure out how to use this, then I should probably not complain about it. I should figure out how to buy a train ticket. But the point is, these kinds of interfaces are everywhere, and we use it every day. And as we now bring our own devices and our own consumer experiences into the enterprise software, a lot of people, for a lot of us, it's just not good enough anymore that enterprise software isn't good. But first, we have to understand the problem, like good designers, before we can solve it. Um, so why does it suck? And to me, I think there's two, uh, there's two main reasons, and I promise you I didn't talk to anyone else before doing this. There's a, this idea of lack of empathy and just way too much legacy, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, each of those. So the biggest problem with enterprise software is and probably something that you'll, you'll notice in, uh, immediately. You have this piece of software. It's sold to this very important person with a suit on, but it's actually used by this person. And the big problem is that those two people are very much not the same. Okay, so if you look at the difference between them, there are big differences. This person wants control, configurability, compliance, features. If you want to, in our case, make them move from SharePoint, you have to explain if we have, SharePoint has 173 use cases, we have 180 use cases, so you should totally go with us. Because no one ever got fired for you know hiring Microsoft, so we should we have we that's the kind of thing that we compete on. However, since we're productivity software, this person cares about something else. They just want to get their work done, and the problem you have is that those needs are very much misaligned, and because the person on the left is the person paying for the software, that's the person whose opinion carries the most weight. Unfortunately, there's a problem with this. There's a death spiral thing going on. And, and let, me tell, let me give you the, the most uh, obvious sentence in the world. As fewer people are able to use the software, fewer people want to use it until no one uses it anymore. And I know that sounds like the most obvious thing in the world, but we seem to not understand that, yes, you might sell the thing, but if no one can use it, they're not going to renew the thing, and then that money goes away. So there's a really good reason for not just designing for this person, not designing for features and timelines, but actually building for something I'll talk a little bit about later as well, which I'm sure many of you know about, the job to be done. Why do people use our software? What are they trying to get done with the software that we use? And without empathy for that person, we're never going to be able to improve our software. 
That's the first reason. The second reason is uh, this idea of too much legacy. There's so much going on. I loved a uh, country member who had said earlier that uh, we, we pretend to be agile, um, but what we really mean is it's uh, agile within waterfall. So uh, the developers might, b making sprints don't make you agile. And I think that a lot of us don't uh, understand that. Or, or, or the wonderful thing we always say in enterprise software is, oh, we, we, we use the spirit of, of agile. That's, uh, th that's often what people say when they have sprints and a scrum master and, and, and stand-ups and nothing else. So we still have these waterfall processes where a lot of people have to sign off on things, a lot of people have to be involved before you can get anything done. And this is because there are tons of silos in these organizations that often don't talk to each other. We talk about collaboration, but we often don't do it. I just read an article this week about a guy who was saying um, that his company sent out this huge memo about how people have to collaborate, but if uh, someone in, from, a different, from a department invited you to their meeting, you had to charge their cost center for the time that you spent with them. So that's, uh, you might say you want collaboration, but that's not probably the best way to go about it. And then of course there's lots and lots of bureaucracy. So there's lots of layers and layers of people who have to sign off on things and know exactly what has to be done. Who wants to come work in enterprise with me? <laughs> Sounds fun, right? No? Okay, well, okay. Anyway, so what happens is that, as John Kolko is famous for saying, the dysfunction in the organization becomes the dysfunction in the product, and that gets passed on to customers. And you see that a lot in, in um, things like financial software, where you can clearly see how the functional departments get through in the information architecture. Have you seen that? Um, or, uh, so you, you, have these diff you have the business side of banking, and you have the personal side of banking, and you have the credit card side. And what they basically do is they take their organizational structure and put it in the main nav, and we're done. That's our information architecture. And that's what often happens. We just kind of give up, and we say, well, we're, we're not as good as we want to be. There's some dysfunction here, but uh, we're going to pass that on to customers. So that's the problem, and luckily I'm not going to stop there. I think there are ways to actually solve this and, and make it a little better. And that's what I'm going to talk about next is how do we make this better? How do we unsuck it? So there's four things. The first one that I think is really important for us as designers is to show the business value of design. So I think what happens in organizations like this is uh, enterprise software doesn't suck because designers don't care or we don't have taste. Um, it sucks because we don't have agency. It sucks because we can't really do the things that we really want to do, and then we kind of give up and, and software just happens. And so we have to first bring people along on this, and this is some of the stuff that's worked for me. So there's, there are great ways to show the business value of design. I'll show you just two of them. One is this design value index that just came out in 2014 that shows that uh, the design uh, market capitalization weighted index comprised of design driven companies shows year to year, 10 year returns of 219% over that of the S&P 500 from 2004 to 2014. Cool, more money. Okay, that's one thing. It's not just more money though, as uh, someone uh, before me actually mentioned this research as well. There's also from this ancient book, Software Engineering, a Practitioner's Approach. Uh, which you can purchase for the lovely price of $130 on Amazon. Please use my affiliate link when you do that. Um, the cost of making changes over time, if you make changes during design, if that's 1x, the, the cost of making changes during development is six times that, and the cost of making changes once a thing is live is 100 times that. Um, Marty Kagan has this famous quote where he says, a lot of organizations use their entire engineering team as prototypers, and they use their entire user base as unwitting test subjects for their prototypes. Mm -hmm. And that's why it takes two to three years to get software right or never, because instead of using lightweight prototyping and testing that with users, we use our, all our resources from our engineering team to build out fully, fully functional software, and then uh, we're surprised if it doesn't quite work. And that becomes really, really expensive. But the problem is we can't just show why it's important. We also have to show how we're going to fit into process. And that's where the second point comes in. One of the things I love about user-centered design is that it shrinks to fit. Um, uh, the first thing people will tell you when you say, let's do some research, is that'll take too long. 
Now, the thing that's great about what I don't understand is we always seem to have time to do things over, but we never have time to do it right. So there's always time for a phase two or a phase three, but we, we don't want to spend the time up front to do things right. But what's great is we can say if you have these different phases of a, of a project or different things that we want to do, we want to explore what the, big pro what the main problems are through ethnography or in-home visits. We want, to do, we want to build prototypes. We want to use a test those prototypes. If you have, um, based on how much money or time you have available, you can do different things. If you have lots of budget, you can do a full-on ethnographic study. If you don't, you can do some phone interviews. If you have even less money, you can ask a friend. Again, it's, not the, it's not the best research to do that, but it's still better than not doing it at all. For prototypes, sure, if you can build an HTML prototype. Don't dance on Axior's grave yet, as I saw a post uh, earlier this week. Apparently, your X design is dead, everyone. I just wanted to let you know that. Um, the internet said so, so it has to be true. So the, <laughs> you can also build a clickable prototype in Axure or Paper um, or uh, Proto.io, which is what you use, and then was another tool that someone else mentioned, or just make a paper sketch. All these things are useful to get feedback from. If you have user testing, you can do formal usability testing. You can do uh, rapid iterative testing and evaluate. Oh, that's not right. Show someone. That's better. Got to represent Portland. <laughs> you can go to, got, just representing Portland, everyone. Hey, shout out. OK. Shout out to my, no, never mind. So sh show someone, go to a coffee shop, just show someone what you made, even if it's paper sketches. Ask them to, to go through it, and you still get valuable feedback. And once people understand, that user testing doesn't necessarily mean $100,000 in five weeks, that then it's much easier to get it into the organization. All right, the third thing is turning sales into a product design functions. Now, I've, the, the worst relationships usually in enterprise uh, companies is the relationship between sales and product. And they both have, unfortunately, legitimate concerns about each other. Product is really mad at sales because they go and sell stuff that doesn't exist in, that don't exist in the product yet. And sales get really angry because they feel like they know the product really well and no one listens to their feedback. And both of those statements are unfortunately true. And the only way I've found to actually bridge that gap is to give everyone a common framework to talk about this stuff. And the framework that I really like using is jobs to be done, as I said earlier, and particularly this one, the product forces framework, which basically says if you want to move someone from an existing behavior to a new behavior, there are different forces at work. There's progress making forces, which is reasons why you wouldn't want to do, use the existing thing anymore. The push of the situation, I, SharePoint's ugly, I don't want to use it anymore. There's the pull of the new idea. Oh, this thing looks really nice, I really want to use it. But then there's the progress hindering forces, allegiance to current behavior. In our case, it's, but SharePoint has folders, and your thing doesn't have folders, so I really need my folders. And that's real, actually. And then there's the anxiety, <laughs> that's, they don't make that up. People really love their folders. Um, and then there's the anxiety of the new situation in saying, I don't know if your thing has all the features that I need. And the point is that for someone to move from someone else's software to yours, the progress-making forces have to be stronger than the progress-hindering forces. It's a very simple model, but this is a great way to sell a product, and it's also a great way to build a product. So if you're able to talk to your sales team and have them um, uh, understand this and have them sell the product this way and get feedback from them about what they hear about these forces, that's going to take you a long way. And as you move over uh, into collaboration, that'll also make the other thing better, where they start to, sell, start to sell stuff that don't happen yet. That only works if you bring them in closer to the, uh, to the product development process. And that's the fourth thing. Break down those silos through collaboration. And um, a lot of the other speakers have talked to some of these techniques, but these are some of the things that we've used um, very effectively. And also, as we're a very distributed team, so a lot of this happens through video conferencing and, and software, but we just do it. One of the things we always do at the start of project, projects now is product discovery, where we get, for the first time in the company's history, uh, representatives from everywhere, sales, sales engineering, professional services, all the way through to engineering, 
in the same room, representatives, and we talk about things like, what are the user needs we're trying to solve? What is the business goals of these things that we're trying to solve? What are our core competencies? In other words, how are we going to be better than someone else? We build personas together. We make customer journey maps together. And we go through affinity diagramming um, on, on all the features that we want to build. And everyone agrees. It takes us a day or two. But at the end, the entire organization or representatives understand what the product is that we're trying to build. And they can defend. Um, because what, what a lot of our product managers tend to spend time on is defending their decisions to every single silo in the organization. If you bring everyone together from the beginning, that doesn't have to happen anymore. Design Studio, I'm also a huge fan of that. Um, uh, if, uh, the methods differ, but getting people together and having them sketch separately and then giving feedback and then sketching as a group, you get absolutely amazing ideas from people who you never thought you'd get amazing ideas from. Uh, especially those who are very close to the product. And the importance of user research is just so huge. So uh, what you get with a lot of this stuff is once you bring someone along, uh, whether that's on, in ethnography or in your user testing, first they're going to be incredibly depressed. So they're going to possibly cry. Um, when they see someone use their software for the first time and realize how bad it can be, but what's amazing is the resilience of engineers. <laughs> how they <laughs> come out of that crying session and say, now, OK, how can we fix this? And bring people along on that. Or if you can't, I, I always record all our sessions and put it on CD for Friday night viewing. People have, I don't know, when there's nothing on Netflix, you've got to watch some user research sessions. <laughs> um, and and making, uh, uh, making video clips and things like that. Working with the team together. So gone are the days of PowerPoint decks, even in an enterprise. We sit in a room together and we collaborate on the document about what we're going to change and based on the feedback that we got. And that has been really useful for us to use some of these techniques to bring everyone together. And it's starting to change. I'm not going to say Jive is perfect at this, but it's really starting to change. It also helps that this is a direct quote from our CEO to say, we want to be a design-led company. That's really useful if this shows up in press releases and we can say, but Elisa said so, so we have to do user research. And like I said, a lot of the stuff that we do is, is uh, remote. So this is, we're doing Design Studio in this session. And what you see on the left there is a product called Murally, which some of you might know. It's virtual whiteboarding with, with sticky notes. Yes, you can you know, tear it up and throw it away, but it's a bad idea. You just have to kind of delete it. But, so it's not the same satisfaction when you throw an idea out, but it gets the job done. And it's uh, surprisingly easy to move things around. This is how we do usability testing. We use a video conferencing system called Video, and we, I sign into a room, and anyone from anywhere in the world, because we have developers in Israel and Palo Alto and all across the states, they can dial in, and they can see on the, on the left, they can see me talking to the person, and on the right, they can see what's going on in the screen, because um, we built a little thing that you can see there. For this, is, this was mobile testing. And this has really started to, I think, bear fruit for us. Uh, you'll start to see some of the new products that are coming out for us that don't quite look like enterprise projects, uh, products anymore. Jive Daily is, a, is a, a corporate communications app that starts to look OK, starts to look pretty good, actually, because we're using these processes to focus on what users need when they, and what consumer experiences are about. So if I can summarize this another way, I would say the following. There's four, these four things. If you want to bring people along into that process uh, of, of making enterprise software better, I think the most important thing is to realize that the role of a product designer or a UX designer in enterprise is a lot more about facilitation than it is about design. And that might sound weird, but it, it, it is a lot of the stuff that you make is throwaway or sits in documents. But the goal of that facilitation is to bring everyone along in the process. So the first thing is to show them why it's important. Why should we do this? It's going to make us more money, and it's going to reduce our costs. So obviously, we need to find a way to do it. Then you show them it's not going to make their lives difficult. We're not going to add five weeks to your sprint. We're going to maybe add a day or two, and we're going to save so much in the process that it's a really good investment to make. Give them a framework that covers the, the whole product for a way for us to talk about um, product forces and, and use that to prioritize features have been really useful. And the most important thing is make them part of the process. And that's what it all comes down to. Traditionally, in, in, in enterprise and large corporations, as much as we talk about collaboration, 
as we all know, there's still so much politics going on. And when, once you realize that as designers, we look good when the product looks good, <laughs> there's, there's a lot more incentive for us to bring everyone along in that process. And those are some of the things that I've found help uh, for us. I also say that we are hiring. I think everyone's saying that right now. And we have beer on tap, so you should, um, <laughs> you should probably come talk to us. And that's it. Thank you very much.